We excavated 29 graves and two of them had double burials in them. Um, both of them were infants, children. Um, so we found the, the people and also we found the, the coffins, the remains of the coffins and um, all the coffin furniture which relates of course to the Victorian funerary traditions and um, how funerals were carried out, Victorian attitude towards death and also the way these traditions are carried over from England to New Zealand and we found very strong evidence that the, the funerals here in sunny Milton were in some ways very similar to those in England. The human remains are at the anatomy department at the University of Otago and they've been worked on and there's various analyses been done on them, DNA, strontium isotopes and things like that. The coffin furniture, the, the, the more archaeological material, that's in the lab I run and some of that's been x-rayed and that's been cleaned, described, photographed. And what will happen to all of this at the end of it? At the end, everything will be put back in the ground, back into the, the graves it came from. So everything will, will come back here to St John's. Uh, we know that there was very high infant mortality. We, we did find a lot of um, children and infants. So, you know, for parents that would have been very tough. Um, we know that some people had tuberculosis. So there was, you know, sickness in, in the community, which was probably quite common at the time. Um, dental health was very bad, so people would have you know, been in pain quite a lot of the time um, from their teeth. When we were excavating, each time we, we found a grave, found a new burial, um, the vicar, Vivian, she would uh, do a blessing over the burial and then we'd you know, lift that burial if it was in good enough condition. The parish were divided more or less straight in half. Some felt that, like the bishop, scientists need things to study. It would be fascinating to learn more about those who had gone before us. And others felt that it was not appropriate to be removing structure, uh, skeletons from the place where they'd been laid. I was impressed with the parish because they chose not to put it to the vote. They just asked that I indicate their different views to the bishop and those who didn't like the idea said that they would not oppose any studies. Come November when the investigation, the digging actually started, Bishop Calvin and somebody from the Marae at Otakau blessed the ground and it was arranged that whenever material was to be removed I would go up and give thanks for the life of the person who was to be removed, to remember those who had carried this person to that site, and to bless the, those who were working there. So I did that. At the public meeting, Bishop Calvin had agreed that any material that was to be returned would be buried with the 1662 burial service. And so before this person was recovered, I used part of the 1662 burial service to reinter him. My role in the project was to help with the assessment of the, the biological evidence from the skeleton. So, so what we found was uh, a number of individuals that we were able to identify from the writing that was on, their, on the, the coffin. So what we had there is a very unique situation where we had the, the social history of the person because we knew um, their, their age, their sex, what they died of, um, something about their history. And then we were also able to put the biological history on top of that. So then be able to say um, how tall the person was, what sort of work they might have done, uh, whether they smoked a pipe or, um, or uh, if there was evidence in their bones of having had given birth. For example, so probably one of the one of the most intriguing stories, and also a quite tragic story, is that of the husband and wife, the the local doctor and his wife. Uh, she died in childbirth, and um, then he died some 11 months later from after she died. And so, from those two people, we could get uh, we could get an idea of how how tall she was, she was my height, five foot three, 
and uh, also um, the fact that she'd lost a number of her teeth before. She was only 36 years of age when she died um, and she had a filling in her tooth uh, which had actually broken her tooth and she'd lost all of her molars um, probably from actually being pulled out from dental decay. Uh, her husband, the doctor, he had lost some of his teeth but he also had a gold filling which is something which is, you know, shows that they had uh, a different social standing to the other people. Other people um, from the, the site, the other adults that had evidence of had the teeth still remaining, they had lots of dental decay, a lot of dental decay. And so most of them had already lost all of their molars, their back teeth. Uh, all of the men showed evidence of having smoked a pipe, clay pipe, because there's a very particular facet that you get in your, in your teeth. Sugar actually was becoming more accessible to people during the mid to late 19th century and so we're sort of starting to see the initial scourge of, of sugar and what it does to people's dental health and so forth. And for many of these people who lived and died here as adults in Milton were actually born elsewhere and had actually been born in the UK um, and, and a lot of them coming from an urban life to a rural life so this is one of the things that we are investigating, is looking at the difference in their diet as children, which we can see from the teeth, and then the evidence of the diet from um, the last 10 or 15 years of their life. And one of the things that's really special about this project is that we are looking at people who are living in a semi-rural environment. These are people who came to start breaking in the land, you know, four of the first farms in this area. You know, so, and they came from the cities. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, heavy, a lot of evidence of muscle activity. We're seeing a lot of evidence of trauma, of fractures. Um, amongst the children, um, we had a number of young babies and young children. Um, there, uh, um, we were able to get reasonable estimates of age of those children and match them up to uh, the historical records. We've been able to do that in um, two or three cases. And one story was a, um, a two sisters who died on the same day of whooping cough. So this is a disease which today is, you know, almost eradicated, um, but was a, a, a really serious illness in, in the mid 19th century and in that case those children died. And there's also cases of children, young children dying um, from accidental drownings. So it, it would have been a hard life. Um, now whether that's better than the life they would have had in England, and that's a, that's a much more difficult question to answer and that will really come down to a lot of comparative work with um, you know, material that's been excavated in England and English studies. So I think it was it was a tough life. The, the, you know, opening up a you know a new world, as it were, would have been hard work, and these people, you know, had it tough. <laughs>